first letter to the Corinthians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord. Chapter 1 and verse 3. Fight the good fight, Timothy chapter 6. Turning now to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 19 and verse 2. Deuteronomy, chapter 19, verse 2. Thou shalt separate three cities for thee in the midst of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. And our study before us is uh, about the kindest laws in the world. We've been looking at Deuteronomy, at various themes which are found in it. It is the last sermons of Moses, sermons that are now some three and a half thousand years old. It is to be treated in a homiletical way, this book. They are exhortations, they are sermons, they are encouragements to God's people. And we'll look at just a two or three chapters, a few passages in them, to demonstrate the tremendous kindness of the laws of God in olden times. Now, we are so often hearing criticism of the Old Testament. And as I mentioned in the prayer meeting, the God of the Old Testament is said to be a cruel God. The Old Testament is supposed to be a record of death and genocide and uh, taking of life and great cruelty and terrible things. The God of the Old Testament is contrasted with the God of the New Testament and the teaching of Jesus Christ. And all this to make the Bible appear absurd and the Christian faith absurd also. But of course these ideas are based on ignorance of the Bible, of God's book and the things that it uh, reveals to the human race. The Old Testament is full of kindness. So we'll just lift up our hearts and look at some of these things and learn from them on the way. But our principal theme is the kindest laws in the world without uh, any doubt. Just look at these first two verses of chapter 19 and we'll proceed briskly. When the Lord thy God hath cut off the nations whose land the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou succeedest them and dwellest in their cities and in their houses, then there will first of all be three cities. In due course there'll be three on the east of Jordan, three on the west, and there is a promise of three more if the entire boundaries of the land which God had promised had been filled and successfully uh, uh, taken. But they achieved six and no more. However, the cities of refuge, as the uh, Moses explains, reminds them, well, this has all been revealed to them previously, the cities of refuge were for justice. There was a culture of vengeance among the people. There was family revenge. A life was taken, you took a life without necessarily taking recourse to the priests or the elders or the courts. That was the culture which the people had inherited from Egypt, presumably, and elsewhere. But the kind laws of God regulate this because, you know, I won't explain the cities of refuge in detail, but there is the very provision in these verses. Supposing there was an accidental death and the head flies off the axe of a workman and kills a colleague. And the family of that colleague uh, move too quickly and seek to gain redress or vengeance and take the life of the person who was wielding the axe. Ah, but there are all kinds of things could have happened. And if the person is innocent, he can flee and he can run to a city of refuge. And there were special provisions, as you probably know, to clear the routes to these cities. And once he reached just within the borders, even the outer suburbs of a city of refuge, the pursuer could not take his life, and the city of refuge had to act host 
and had to set the wheels of proper investigation and justice in motion. But here, <laughs> the kindest laws in the world, provision is made for the innocent, for accidents, and uh, uh, if the person is guilty, and in due course there is a trial, well then he'll forfeit his life. And there was the death sentence in ancient Israel to serve as a deterrent. And the people, some of the punishments might seem severe to us today. We remember, of course, that the Israelites were a special people and they had tremendous privileges and they had first-hand demonstrations of the power of God and the goodness of God. And they were attended by miracles and many, many blessings upon their nation, upon their people. They, of all people, should be believers, should be moved to believe and to respond to the law which God had given them. And there could not be in Israel a culture, there was anyway, but there could not be a culture of murder and rape and adultery, the land polluted and turned over to the idolatry of the neighboring nations. And so the punishments to keep the land pure were severe, but they were a people who had unusual and wonderful privileges. Why, uh, it should have been almost impossible to be an atheist in Israel of old with the mighty blessings and overrulings of God that they had. But then they had a special function, and that was to preserve themselves from idolatry and to be trained in the things of God until the coming of the Savior of the world. And they had to be kept distinct and holy as a people. So it's not surprising that uh, particularly in the early stages, the punishments were severe for terrible offenses. And even those severe punishments were acts of kindness because undoubtedly the land was kept purer and happier by far than it would otherwise have been. But here we see provision for justice, lest people should be innocent. Look down to verse 14 of chapter 19. And I read these words. Thou shalt not remove thy neighbor's landmark, which they of old time have set in thine inheritance, which thou shalt inherit in the land. Every tribe, every grouping, every family had an inheritance, a portion of land. They could not be deprived of that. Even much later on in the history of Israel, as you know, kings couldn't take away a person's vineyard or purchase it by compulsory purchase. You could only forfeit land if by some great misfortune you got into heavy debt, you couldn't pay your debts, well then you might have to forfeit land. Otherwise, there was written into the law of ancient Israel the preservation of your portion, your plot, your small holding, your inheritance, as it's called, your entitlement. And uh, nobody and no authority could take it away from you. Part of the kindness, the provisions of God, so that everyone would be provided for. But let's look at a number of these uh, laws because they're so... Uh, well, verse 15, the very next verse in chapter 19. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or three shall the matter be established. But then there is a special provision for cases where there can only be one witness or one accuser. And there's a particularly careful examination of the case prescribed for that. Then I look down to verse 21, a very troublesome verse, you might think. It sounds contrary to kindness. Thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. The law of retaliation. Elsewhere, bruise for bruise. But the point of this is to regulate the punishments. The punishment must 
fit the crime. In the nations round about, and in Egypt, from where the Israelites drew much of their natural culture, the punishment never fitted the crime. It doesn't in parts of the world where some of these uh, physical punishments are applied today. You steal an apple in some places. You can have your hand cut off or your arm cut off. You say, insult the wrong person, someone in a high place. You can have your tongue cut out. There's nothing like that in the laws of ancient Israel. This is to regulate. This is to limit the punishments. The punishment must fit the crime. There is only one case in the Pentateuch where there is the punishment for the removal of a hand for something other than having done that very thing yourself in attacking somebody. Now there, it could be that the court said that if you uh, uh, cause the loss of somebody's limb or their life, then your punishment would be in accordance with that. There's only one exception, and that is where something uh, very immodest and awful is done uh, to, to, from, by a, a woman to a man, in the case we'll come to it, two men fighting. And uh, that's the only case where there is the removal of a hand for a crime, where something particularly foul and immodest is done. We may have time to come to it. But this is a punishment should fit the crime. So in cases of extreme violence, then this uh, life for life, tooth for tooth punishment can be applied. Did not the Lord Jesus Christ countermand that and contradict that? Well, no. What the Lord Jesus Christ was pointing out in Matthew 5 and verse 38 in the part of the Sermon on the Mount was that the Jewish authorities and the scribes and the Pharisees were teaching the law of retaliation in for private offences, not for the case that the Old Testament intended, a court of law punishing somebody who had violently killed or maimed somebody else, but simply as a law of private vengeance. If I am insulted, I can do something to you, something which I consider fits what you've done to me and is not precisely in accordance with this uh, uh, prescription at all. And anyway, the standard of the Old Testament is that you shouldn't seek these penalties unless they're absolutely necessary. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in no wise rebuke thy neighbour and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Thou shalt not avenge. That's Leviticus 19 and verse 18. However, in the case of brutality and violence, the law and the court could give punishment, but the punishment must fit the crime and be no greater than the crime demands. So actually, it's a law of kindness and limitation. And then we look down to chapter 20, and I shall proceed fairly quickly. And here it is, the uh, uh, time has come, there is battle, there is war, and here are special provisions for warfare. Verse 5 of chapter 20. The officers shall speak unto the people, saying, what man is there that hath built a new house and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. Well, that's very unusual. Uh, that's unique to the laws of Israel. You won't find anything quite as generous and kindly as that in uh, modern administration. If you're conscripted or called up, Remember, I go back to the days of national service. Nobody said to you, have you any particular problems? Have you just got married by any chance? Well, then you don't need to come. Have you just, you know, rented a new house or flat? Well, you've got to go and look after it. Nobody has ever spoke to you like that. How unique are the laws of ancient Israel and understanding 
oh no, there were certain people there who in particular personal circumstances and they mustn't come. Verse 6, what man is he that hath planted a vineyard and hath not yet eaten of it? Let him also go and return to his house. And then the married person, the recently married, verse 7 and verse 8, listen to this. Who ever heard of this outside the laws of ancient Israel? This is supposed to be the Old Testament of cruelty and hatred and unkindness. And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Who's afraid? Well, you don't have to come. Amazing. You might think if they said that today, everybody would decide they were afraid. And there wouldn't be an army, and there wouldn't be a defense. There seems to have been a lot of patriotism and sense of duty for them to be able to bring this particular law in, but they did. What man is there that is, that is fearful and faint-hearted? Why, up until World War I, we were still shooting the people who were designated as cowards. Even if they were wandering around shell-shocked and plainly ill and couldn't help it. Some were sent back from the front, but some were just shot. So these laws are way ahead of their time, so far unequaled anywhere, I would think. Though, of course, I don't know what happens everywhere, but most unusual. Some of the kindness of the laws of ancient Israel are here. And then uh, there's an interesting verse 9. It shall be when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people. The officers seem to have been the elders of the people that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. The elders will appoint the junior officers in the army. That's quite interesting. They were all appointed men. In the American Civil War, which began 1861, uh, the uh, Southern Confederate armies decided that even in war, they would conduct themselves democratically and the junior officers would all be elected by the men. And so for the first couple of years, that happened. The junior officers were all elected. The trouble with that is the men elected the good blokes, the people who were amenable to reason and all the rest of it, not the more firm personalities. So great battles were fought with a third of the Confederate armies allowed to slip away on weekend pass, or whatever they called it, because the officers were too amenable. Oh, but my mother can't cope. My father's sick. Go home, go home. And then General Lee got the Confederate armies by the scruff of the neck and said, in future, the junior officer, officers are appointed by the senior officers. This is no time for democracy. And the tide turned, and they were infinitely more successful. I think I probably oversimplified that, but it was roughly along those lines. Well, we turn back to the Word of God, and of course, uh, this is probably where General Lee went. And uh, you find that the junior officers were all appointed by the seniors. But I proceed, and uh, down in chapter 20 and verse 10. We dealt with this not so long ago in another context, so I shall be brief. When thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. And it shall be, if it make the answer of peace and open unto thee, then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. Those were the marching orders always of the children of Israel. And this particular verse is not only for the distant cities, because it's reflected elsewhere, it's for all cities. First of all, there is to be peace offered. You don't see this in the earlier addresses of Moses, because they are not so much detailed marching orders, but predictive in character. And he would say to the children of Israel, when you come into the land that God has given you, you will seize everything and you will mow the enemies down before you. 
Well, that is in the end what happened. But the actual marching orders is that you'll never lay siege and you'll, you'll never attack until you've offered peace and terms of peace and offered them seriously and sincerely and made provision for their acceptance. And only if that's repudiated will you attack. Will you proceed? And of course, aside from Jericho, actually, most of the skirmishes and the battles, certainly under Joshua, were defensive ones because the enemy would reject the peace and attack first and show the aggression. So there was never really any doubt about what the Israelites would have to do. And then you read on and there are verses that worry people, which we have looked at not too long ago. And... Uh, then uh, uh, verse 13, when the Lord thy God, this is chapter 20, hath delivered it into thine hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. But the women, the little one, the cattle, and, and all the spoil will be preserved for you. Now that is for the distant cities, not the Canaanite cities. But the Canaanite cities, well, that's uh, verse 17, thou, or verse 16. But of the cities of these people, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, the evil Canaanite cities, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth, but thou shalt utterly destroy them. Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, and so on. But we know that that is not what happened. We know that, in fact, considerable populations of the Canaanites remained after these battles. Not because the Israelites didn't obey the Lord, but because these instructions clearly apply to the garrison cities and not to the general populations. There never was genocide. There never was destruction of whole populations. But where there was a fortified city that was uh, aggressive, the militants that remained in that city, with the families if they remained, but usually in the warfare of those times, the families would be out. The civilians, as it were, and the wives and the children would be out of the fortified city and gone. But if any remained, and they remained with their men, well then, they were the militants. And those people were all destroyed. But the only way you can account for the huge amounts of people among the Canaanites who remained alive and existing in the land and in the surrounding areas it was, is the fact that the, the particularly severe uh, dealing with people was relating, as the text strictly says, to the cities, to the garrison cities, the walled cities of the Canaanites. And so we remember that when people talk about genocide. They seem to be unaware that populations were never destroyed and that they all, in fact, remained. They don't know their Bibles. That's the trouble. Look to chapter 21 and verses, the first verses. If one be found slain in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it, lying in the field, and it be not known who hath slain him, there's presumably been extensive investigation. No idea how the, this man was murdered or this woman. Then thy elders and thy judges shall come forth and they shall measure unto the cities, the villages, which are round about him that is slain. Which is the nearest village? And verse 3, responsibility will be accorded to that village or city, whatever it is, which is next to the slain man. And then there's a very curious rite that is to be followed, and it starts halfway through verse 3. The elders of that city shall take an heifer. They are required to assume responsibility for the death. A heifer which has never been worked and which has not drawn the yoke. And in verse 4, they will bring down the heifer into a rough valley. Why a valley? Probably to demonstrate, some think, that this is not an act of worship 
or anything of that order, which is neither eared nor sown, a desolate place, and shall strike off the heifer's neck, break its neck, and kill it in that way there in the valley. It's not a sacrifice, though. It's a solemn rite. And the priests, verse 5, shall come near, for them the Lord thy God hath chosen to minister unto him and to bless. And by their word shall every controversy be tried. And the elders of the city shall wash their hands over the heifer that is beheaded in the valley. And they shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. And there will be the prayer, the plea to God to be merciful. It's a solemn enactment. And the whole purpose of it is that if a life is lost and someone is murdered and there's no knowing who did this deed, you don't just close the file in the back room of a police station. It's a public matter and there is a ceremony and the nearest village accepts responsibility and yet pleads innocence before God and prays for mercy. And all the people have impressed upon their minds the sacred nature of human life, that a terrible thing has happened, it ought not to have happened, and somebody is responsible. And that is part of the kindness of the laws of Israel. Different ways are brought in by Moses acting under inspiration to strengthen the sanctity of human life and to make sure the people have a deep respect for these things and murder is ever detested as an awful thing, as an, abom an abomination. These are the laws of Israel. These are unparalleled anywhere. This training of the minds of the people, the whole town grieves and life is sacred. Look down to verse 10. When thou goest forth to war against thine enemies, and the Lord thy God hath delivered them into thine hands, and thou hast taken them captive, and seest among the captives a beautiful woman, and hast a desire unto her, that thou wouldst have her to be thy wife, we assume this is not a Canaanite city, but one of the more distant places. Verse 12, then this is the instructions to a soldier who falls hopelessly in love with a woman in a conquered town at some distance. Then thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and she shall shave her head and pare her nails, partly a kind of ceremonial cleansing, if she's willing to undergo this, presumably, from her background and her idolatrous religion. And she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her, well, she was obviously beautifully dressed. So she's got to be very simply dressed because a month has got to pass while she bewails her father and her mother. But maybe the soldier will change his mind in a month when she doesn't look quite so beautiful because she's had to shave her head and wear a simple garment and not appear so beautiful. So for her point of view, is she going to get homesick? and miss her hometown and decide she doesn't want to go through with this and marry this soldier in a foreign place? Or is he going to decide she's not so beautiful? Now he's back home and his sudden love fade. What remarkable provisions. Your first reading through of a passage like this, you think, what a peculiar thing. So you look at it more carefully and you think, this is astonishing. You can see the wisdom behind this provision and the care because there must be real affection and it must be proved then only after that will you marry her the passage says effectively and verse 14 if it doesn't work out and thou have no delight in her that sounds worse than it is that means she behaves very badly it turns out she wants to go back to her idolatry or it turns out she's uh, been uh, uh, 
uh, a very loose woman prior to this, or for some reason we assume it's justified because all the passages that, that are phrased like this in the Pentateuch assume that there's a real problem. It's not just, oh, I've changed my mind. If thou have no delight in her, you make discoveries, and this marriage simply cannot go on, then thou shalt let her go whither she will. She will choose where she goes, and you've got to look after her. But thou shalt not sell her at all for money. You won't take advantage of her, because she wants to go home to her country, and this just is not going to work out. Thou shalt not make merchandise of her. But she's a foreigner. She's not an Israelite. Can't I do what I like? She cheated me. No. You've still got to treat her honorably. These are the kindest laws in the world to people. Because in a measure, she's wronged you, but you've wronged her too. So you've got to be so careful. Because thou hast humbled her. So you've got to treat her very well. And then verse 15, if a man have two wives, one beloved and another hated. Actually, the Hebrew says, if a man has had two wives. So we're not quite clear whether only one is living. And this is uh, uh, one wife after another, where the first one has died or gone or something, or whether it really is polygamy. Anyway, we'll read it as though it could be polygamy. If a man have two wives, which was wrong, and it was against the law of Israel, and it was against the book of Genesis, of course, and the constitution of man, nevertheless, in that big society, these things were happening. Even royalty did it, setting a bad example to the people. One beloved and another hated, and they have both borne him children. Look at this extraordinarily fair provision. And if the first wife is the one who is disliked and the second wife is the one who is really liked and loved, nevertheless, the inheritance will go to the son of the first wife or at least the double portion of the inheritance. You must be scrupulously fair and the children must be properly treated. So there's a provision the polygamy isn't endorsed, it isn't advocated, but if it happens, be careful, says the law of Israel, that the children are treated properly in accordance with the law and not in accordance with the whim of the husband. So I just draw your attention to some of these remarkable things and uh, the kindness that is built in to the law. Look at chapter 21 and verse 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, now this begins to strike alarm within us because everybody who has a son, with very few exceptions, has had at times a stubborn and rebellious son. So whatever are we reading here about a stubborn and rebellious son? If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him bring him out unto the elders of the city and unto the gate of, the, of his place and they shall say unto the elders of this city this our son is stubborn and rebellious he is a glutton and a drunkard and all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die so shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. So we look at this record particularly carefully. Whatever is going on. Well, the first thing you notice is that both the parents must charge the offending son. The mother, who's pretty fed up with him, but she is still her son. He, he, and... Uh, She's not going to have him put to death. Yet this case is so bad that both the parents realize there's nothing can be done and he's a menace and he's a danger and he's a glutton and he's a drunkard. I don't know how old he is. I should think he could be in his 20s or in his very late teens. 
because there's much, I won't turn to it now, against the punishment of children in the laws of Moses. So I should think he's quite mature and he's older. But this case is so bad, can you imagine it? Both the parents have come to the conclusion that such an individual must be removed from the life of Israel. He's such an appalling example. Not just that he's a burden upon them. Can you imagine getting both parents to agree on the death of a son? So you can see this is going to be an extraordinarily bad case and a rare case. And then the punishment is going to be inflicted by all the men of the village, of the place. So they're all going to agree too. This has got to be agreed by the parents, the elders sitting in court with the priests, and all the people in the, in the village have got to endorse it. Well, you might think that's just about impossible, unless this, this boy, really, this young man, really is awful. And then, so shalt thou put evil away from among you, and listen, all Israel shall hear. This is a very rare event. The whole nation shall hear, and they won't just say, oh, don't you know that down in such and such a place, so many miles away, they had to execute a boy? They will fear. So this is a rare thing, and something very serious, and something which instills an immense caution into the whole nation. And can't you see that if parents have got a rebellious son, they are going to do everything in their power, either by discipline or kindness and wooing, every technique you could conceive to bring that child round, that young man round, before such a thing would ever need to happen. And I would think the young man himself would fear it also. And when you look at all the circumstances, you realise it must have been a very rare thing for an awful case to be made such an example of. So actually, what alarms us on first reading was probably a law of extraordinary kindness which had such an influence on the outlook of the nation and the training of the young. Well, I put that to you anyway to think about. Well, time is going on, and I wanted just to touch on one or two other things. Let's look at, uh, uh, pass over some, but chapter 22 and verse 5, some very brief items. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. This is the only place in the Pentateuch that you read this. This law occurs nowhere else. Was it something that was special to Israel? Many of the laws of Israel are special to them. They do not last for all time, like the rites and the ceremonies. But this is more important than that because you read, all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Here is something which is so serious that that phrase is appended. If you wear clothes that belong to the opposite sex, you are an abomination to the Lord God. But this is actually a law of kindness. By doing so, you offend the Creator's design, which is the distinction between the sexes, and that there should be courtesy and respect and kindness. Now, I'm not talking about whether women should wear trousers or jeans or anything of that kind. What I'm saying is this. This law would tell us that if you're a man, you will always look like a man, and if you're a woman, you will always look like a woman. Whether you're dressed in a skirt as a woman or trousers, it will be such, or there will be something else to 
to complement that particular garment which keeps you unmistakably as a woman or which keeps you unmistakably as a man. So with that garment that may be common to both sexes, you will make sure that it's balanced by something that still identifies you and honours your sex. Because the distinction between the sexes is of crucial importance and it's a deep offence to God if it's fudged and confused. And obviously you can see it these days all the more plainly if a man dresses like a woman. He is making a statement. He's overthrowing God's order. He's spitting at God's appointment to him and saying a thousand other things besides. And so with the woman. And men are to show great courtesy and respect to women and great kindness and so on. We have to have the right attitude to each other and keep these distinctions and maintain the dignity of each sex. So be sure, I'm not saying you shouldn't wear this or you shouldn't wear that, but your total dress must be consistent with your sex. Otherwise, it is an abomination to the Lord. And something can't be an abomination in one testament and not in the other. So it's something we should preserve very carefully, the distinctive appearance of our sex. And then, dear friends, chapter 22, verse 6, which is always called the least of all the commandments. At least, that's what the Jews used to call it. If a bird's nest chance to be before thee in the way, in any tree or on the ground, whether they be young ones or eggs, and the dam, the hen, the mother, sitting upon the young or upon the eggs, thou shalt not take the dam with the young. Now, obviously, there is a practical side to this, but I don't think it's what counts here. Yes, take the eggs, take the nest, but don't take the bird, because if you do, it won't lay any more eggs, and you'll deprive yourself. While this is called the least of the commandments, it's obviously very important because there is a promise attached to it that thy days may be long. That's a very important consideration. But plainly this commandment is about training the people to be sensitive. That hen wouldn't sit there if it wasn't sitting on eggs and on young. It would be away as soon as it saw you. You're taking advantage of its motherhood, of its position. You're seizing the nest and the bird. Yes, but it's only a, it's only a hen. It's only a bird. Yes, but we want you to be more sensitive than that. We want to train you right down at this level, at the level of the animals, not to take undue advantage. Of course, we're permitted to take animals and kill them and cook them and eat them. But the hen sitting on the young has to be more sensitive than to take that. And if you can train a people to understand sensitivity and not taking advantage at this level, well then, with regard to one another, they'll never be cruel. And they'll never extort money from each other and take advantage of each other. So the laws, the kind laws of Moses, are dealing with people even at this level. While the Jews said it's the least of all the laws of Israel, it's a training law. It's shaping attitudes. You mustn't do that kind of thing. And it improves us as people. There's so much more, but I've gone too slowly, alas, that I would have liked to have shown you. When the law of the Sabbath is given, God says, and don't forget your servants. You rest on the Sabbath and make you sure your servants rest on the Sabbath. Nothing as kind as the laws of Israel. You must make sure you never oppress or take advantage. 
says Moses through these pages. I can't turn to them now. Of anyone who's disabled, of anyone who's impoverished, of anyone who's inadequate, of anyone who's widowed, it's all spelled out in the kindest laws in the world. There must be justice for everyone. All life must be secure. People mustn't be afraid for their lives. There must be no excessive punishments. The inadequates and the wrongdoers who have fallen into service and are slaves, every seventh year they've got to be set free. We looked at that more recently. When you hire a worker, it is the law of Israel that you pay him at the end of every day. He's poor. He mustn't be left without food on the table. You've hired him. There's a punishment for you if you don't pay him at the end of every day. In the laws of ancient Israel, the kindness and the consideration of those laws. And then you must preserve the dignity of the poor. The borrowing laws of Israel, aren't they so remarkable? You must lend. Your neighbor has a need and he can't pay his bills or feed his children. You must lend to him and you must lend without interest. How dare you charge interest? It's a great crime. You can only charge interest to a non-Israelite who's come into your country to do business with you. That's different. But to a member of your own people, your own family, no interest. That's a terrible thing. And as we saw in a previous study, there's the law of release. Every seventh year, you let off all your debtors and make sure that if somebody needs your help, you lend him the money, even though in three months' time it's the year of release and you're not going to get it back and you know you're not. You've just lent it to him and the law's going to release him. You still better lend it to him. There's no law like that anywhere in the world other than in ancient Israel. And if you take a pledge off somebody, yes, I'll give you the money, but you must give me something as a pledge. Don't you go into his house, Moses says in these chapters. Don't you march in and take the pledge. Stand outside and wait while he voluntarily brings it to you because he's borrowing money from you, but you have a duty to leave him with his dignity. How amazing is that? the kindness of the laws of ancient Israel. It's just full of it. The freedom and the well-being of others, the rights of children, the laws against slander, and so on. Well, our time is up. There are implications here for Christian living. If we had time, there's a view of our Saviour's heart here, because it's Christ our Lord and Saviour, who is ultimately the author of the laws of ancient Israel. And if he insisted on these kindnesses in ancient times to a people the majority of whom weren't even saved, how kindly he treats his people and how wonderful it will be in the eternal glory. So many rules of kindness. How crazy people are to say this is the Old Testament of cruelty and coarseness.